Next, we'll hear from John Hammock, Associate Professor of Public Policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts and formerly the Executive Director of Oxfam America. Um, so we got another big NGO. Uh, John will give us a perspective of, of an international NGO like Oxfam on the continuing role of media in a place like Haiti uh, once the immediate aftermath is, is done. Thank you. I, I do want to start first uh, by saying a few words about uh, NGOs and disasters. Um, not, not much mention has been made that disasters are a big fundraiser for NGOs, for a group like Oxfam America. That's why you see Care and Save the Children and Oxfam t-shirts when you, all these media people show up. They're always giving an interview in Care t-shirts. Why? Because that translates directly into dollars. The studies have shown that media outlet if, if any time you get out there in the media, it translates to people recognizing, you follow up with a direct mail, you follow up with a phone call, people give more money. And that drives new donors and that drives most of the growth and the giving in the nonprofit world, those who do disasters are, and development are drawn into the nonprofit by humanitarian aid, not by development. And then we try to keep them by giving them the pitch on why it's important to go afterwards, by giving them letters, et cetera, and getting them to be development donors. But humanitarian uh, disaster junkies are there. They respond to every disaster, and you want to reach them. And so there is an ethical issue immediately when you go and work in an NGO about how do you take advantage and how do you take advantage. There was some concern earlier about how the international NGOs were having the media come to their show rather than Haitian show. Uh, the reason is very simple, <laughs> is that they want them to come to their show because they can, they can talk about their own projects and their own projects. 90% of the people who survive a humanitarian crisis survive on their own. They survive on people's help locally. They don't survive on international help. So you have to understand that international help is very essential, in some cases very important for a very short period of time, but most people survive on their own wits, on their own coping strategies over the long term. That is something that most people don't realize, but is absolutely true. And so that's also important to know. Um, the hibiscus of the garbage, the NGO will always go for the garbage because the garbage will hopefully raise money. You saw that buzzard up there with that kid? That's a Save the Children buzzard because they were raising money and we had a very hard time getting that thing pulled ethically from their fundraising materials because it was raising a lot of money for them. So there are incredible issues and the system doesn't support the kind of thing that we'd like to see, but that's the system we live under. Some groups are more ethical than others in their fundraising humanitarian pornography use. Uh, the media. The media also has its own, comes in with, uh, and I can give you story after story about because we also wanted to get in the media, so you have to understand the media. <laughs> I remember going to Bangladesh with the media and in a crisis situation, the media went off. I met them at the, I, I knew they were on the same plane with me because they had a very good press person. They, I met them at the, at, at the baggage because they had all this baggage. And then they were going with World Vision out to see a project the next day. I told them, well, if you don't get what you want, call me at night. I called them because they didn't call me. They hadn't gotten what they wanted. I took them. I said, well, I can certainly take you tomorrow to see what you want. I took them to a place. We'd, we had panned a number of places. I saw they weren't quite getting it. I saw the most horribly looking person I could find. I told them, you want to go and interview this person? They did. And the reason they did, and we knew, they knew, I knew, everybody knew that that was the person who was going to show up on the nightly news. Why? Because the editor in New York was going to edit the, the five hours of footage that they had shown, and they were going to show that because that fit the image of what was happening in Bangladesh on the American image. So it doesn't matter much what the reporter wants to do. It crucially matters what the reporter wants to do, sorry. But it matters what the editor thinks you want to see. And so I think it's also a question of the whole idea of Johnny, the whole morality play of Johnny come marching in and saves the day. The people who get on TV, if you watch it closely, she was absolutely right. It's very racist. They tend to be white. They tend not to be black people because they don't sell. <laughs> because most people watching the news uh, want to see, according to the media, want to see white folks. So I think that is an, those kinds of issues are there on both sides in the humanitarian crisis. Now, what do we do after the crisis, or what do we do in general? First, nonprofits don't have the money that Coca-Cola has, period. We don't have the capacity to mount media campaigns like the private sector. So you have to be incredibly strategic. The first thing you have to do is you have to eliminate your information department and create a press department. And then when you create a press department, it can't do just the press. The press is too broad. You have to exactly what was just said. You have to figure out what your audience is. You got to go after that audience. Who go, and the audience at Oxfam was who donates to Oxfam. 
That was one audience. And who are we trying to influence in Washington, D.C.? Those were the two audiences. We weren't interested in middle America. We weren't interested in who watches most of the programs in the United States. We were interested in who gives docs. Well, Oxford, we have a very good profiles on our donors. They happen to watch the nightly news on Channel 2, you know, in this area. So you go for that news outlet. Reinforces your donations. In the in the if you go to the uh, in the Washington, who are you trying to influence in Washington? Depends if it's a republic. Who depends on where the where your projects are being blocked, <laughs> and those are the people that you want to try to influence. So you have to be very targeted. But even with targeted, we don't have the money to try to influence very well. So what can you do? Human Rights Watch just came out with a little report today. Uh, excuse me, this week, which said which talks about the a crisis which you probably haven't even heard about. That is, the crisis is taking place in Liberia because of what's happening in the Ivory Coast. Have anybody heard about that? They arrested the Ivory Coast dude who's been holding up as president for a long time, okay? And now when they arrested him, and uh, a number of people started to get uptight about it, they started to fight again, a lot of people fl flee into, into uh, Liberia. What happens in Liberia? Well, what happens is there's some small nonprofits there that try to get the word out. I just got an email from Tahitian Health. It's a health organization working on the border of Liberia. They have nothing to do with Ivory Coast. They are feeling the Ivory Coast heat. Who do they target? Their donors? There are people who, it's a very small group, but they target an email immediately. Those kinds of things are relatively effective for a small group. It's very hard, however, to get the Liberian case or the Ivory Coast case into the media in any major way. I would say three, three or four things uh, more. First, the media is basically, the traditional media as we knew it back when I was raised, you know, when you had Cronkite and all that, that's gone. The media, is, is it dying? I have no idea if it's dying, but it's certainly not the same media that we've seen in the past. They're not put, most media, except for a very few, don't have foreign correspondents. And if they do, they're cutting them back. And, and also, the second thing is that much of our American media is no longer interested in really serious journalism, I think. A lot of it's info commercial type media that isn't very in depth. Even the BBC is cutting their staff. They just announced a big cut at the beginning of the year. And so there's a real attack on the media in terms of quality and in terms of the ability to do uh, reporting. That, what do they cut first? They're going to cut international. We don't have the capacity in this country to deal with more than one crisis at a time. You would notice that if you're dealing with Japan, it's Japan. You, if you're dealing with Haiti, it's Haiti. You're not going to have the capacity to deal with Liberia and Ivory Coast. And, and, there are and let me tell you, there are a lot of crises in the world uh, and that aren't necessarily the earthquakes. And, the, and they're going to be more because of climate change. And the political crises that are simmer under the surface don't get any attention at all. The only attention they're going to get are, are like groups like Human Rights Watch and others who will actually then try to target their media campaigns to their targeted audiences. So I think we have to be targeted. Let me also say one last thing. I think we're, uh, or not last thing, but close to last. We have to be innovative. Somebody was saying, how do you were saying, Magnolia, you have to be creative by having another. Um, you, you said you had, you had to be creative in your in your uh, by having a cholera. You don't have to be quite so creative, but <laughs> you can also create your events. Uh, and what some of the nonprofits have done is they've turned to the celebrities, which are both good and bad, because if the celebrity happens to do something horrible, then you get tainted. But if they don't, and you happen to have an event which tracks media, if that's what you're interested in, they can sometimes be helpful. If you do like a, some sort of event with them, that might work. Um, the other thing that you can do is to, is to I, I, I'm going to take, uh, I think, uh, I guess I'll agree with the last speaker, but not the first. I don't think there's anything like neutrality in, 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 in anything to do with humanitarian work. There, it doesn't exist. And a media tries to be neutral, but in fact, it's not. Because you are portraying an image, what ends up in on the TV, regardless of what the reporter was, the, most of the images that end up on TV reinforce stereotypes that in fact reinforce current power structures and reinforce current race structures. And so, I don't think neutrality is something that, that is possible, and therefore, I believe ad media advocates. Media advocates either directly or they do it without knowing they're advocating. It's sort of like a humanitarian organization who says, oh, we're apolitical. There is no apolitical humanitarian organization in the world. You step off that plane, you're making a political statement. You're supporting or not supporting the current government by what you do and how you do it. So I think it's really important for us to understand that all of this, whether it's public health, it's media, or anything else, is very involved with politics. All of this takes place in a cultural setting. It takes place in a political setting. And if you don't understand that it is a political setting, that somebody's going to manipulate you terribly if you don't understand that they are trying to do that. 
So it's very important as those of us who have, you know, bleeding hearts and want to help, and those of us who want to help by reporting the news correctly, to understand that we are instruments of somebody. Who is it? Go on back to it and try to then be instruments to the people you want to support and the powers of the world that you want to support rather than being manipulated by those who want to use you against what you want. Thank you very much.